Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, AIOC, for inviting me here, especially Dr. Amit. And uh, I would be talking on principles in initiating medical therapy in glaucoma. We have had an, uh, an extensive uh, talks about uh, various uh, glaucoma management uh, from uh, uh, other, other speakers. And uh, I would be basically talking about the principles. These principles are basically just the guidelines. It are <coughs> they are not hard and fast that we have to follow each and everyone to the book. But yes, these guidelines are, have to be, uh, for every, every uh, patient, we have to m monitor and modify accordingly. So we know that glaucoma is a group of diseases characterized by optic neuropathy, leading on to visual field defects, and uh, uh, which may or may not be related to in increased intraocular pressure. But it is just the tip of the iceberg. And diagnosed cases are much less than the, the undiagnosed cases. Now, the treatment options that we have available with us are the medical therapy, the lasers, and the surgical therapy. And of, the, <clears throat> of these, the basic principles are uh, based on these three parts, like the age of onset, the rate of progression, and the amount of visual field loss. These are the important parts that we, we should look into. And these are the things that will determine how we control the IOP later on. So if you see at this graph, this uh, normal, we will see that this is the normal aging process and the RNFL loss occurring uh, in a patient. While this one, a, a good controlled uh, glaucoma patient has a, this type of graph over a period of time. Then a person who has been detected glaucoma at a later stage or who develops glaucoma at a later stage will have this type of a graph and we know that we don't need to go too hard on him uh, because uh, of his lifespan and we can, you know, uh, we can um, modulate the therapy accordingly. While a person who has been diagnosed at an earlier age, like here, and he's likely to uh, get a functional loss during uh, his middle or sometime later in his life. So we need to take care of these kind of patients who need to, if they're not treated properly, they'll go this way, where they will have a, 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 a steep downward uh, curve. So this is how the first one was that diagnosed late, but developing uh, slowly, and we need, to, uh, be, uh, we need to set the target pressure accordingly. While this one uh, is the second one which was diagnosed early and has developed the same amount of loss at a much earlier age. And these are the patients that we need to take care of. And uh, these are the ones who we, we need to set a target pressure to. Otherwise, they would go steeply down and they will develop a, a, a defect. So this was the protocol given by the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And they have uh, given that uh, we have to um, categorize basically the patients, uh, open angle patients into ocular hypertension, primary open angle suspect and POAGs. And we know that OHT suspects uh, can be a low risk or high risk, low risk if they have no other family history, no other uh, myopia or other uh, risk factors, and they can be reevaluated every six months, uh, 12 months. While high risk factors having higher uh, uh, IOP range, like more than 25, but without any field or uh, defects or, or anything in the disc, uh, they can be reevaluated six to 12 months. Then POAG suspects, again, they are, we can consider they are the disc suspects basically and have uh, uh, maybe a risk factor, they can be evaluated earlier at six months. While POAG patients, we have to establish a target IOP and ideally five to six uh, visual fields have to be done within two years so that we can uh, determine that the progression is occurring or not. If they are stable, then we can reevaluate every six to 12 months. If they are not stable and there is a progression, then we need to either change the treatment, uh, set a new baseline IOP and then reevaluate uh, even earlier than six months. Similar for the patients of uh, suspected angle closure glaucoma, if there is no uh, peripheral anterior synecy normal disc, these have to be followed up with repeated gonioscopies. While if there is a peripheral anterior synecy, then again we, we need to go for a, a iridotomy. While if there is a high IOP with PAS and with, with a glaucomatous disc, again iridotomy and then manage according to the uh, primary open angle glaucoma. So the principles would be that earlier the onset uh, or detection, the more strict should be our adherence or monitoring. Uh, it is advisable to have at least six visual fields or five at minimum uh, in the first two years to document progression and set a reasonably good target pressure. So target pressure is what pressure? It is defined as a range of intraocular pressure which is adequate to stop progressive uh, pressure induced injury to the optic nerve head. Or it can also be defined as the IOP at which the rate of ganglion cell loss is not greater than the age-related loss. So this is the most important part that we should look into. But there is no clearly defined single IOP level below which the individual is completely safe from developing glaucoma. This was given by Baltimore Eye Survey and Normal Attention Glaucoma Study. 
and to set a, uh, uh, set a, uh, a target pressure, we should, it, it should be based on severity of the damage, height of the IOP where damage occur, and the longevity of the patient, the central corneal thickness, and the family history. These are the things, and to set the uh, target pressure, it should ideally be set, uh, it should, uh, the target pressure should, uh, should be lower than the daily variation, the lowest pressure that we record in a day, the variation, and it has to be uh, more than that. Generally, less than 30% is uh, taken, uh, uh, the IOP has to be reduced more than 30%. And as a rough estimate, uh, if there is a field loss, mild field loss, uh, it should be around 16 to 18 millimeters of mercury, moderate 14 to 16, and severe in 12 to 14. Uh, it, it can be uh, lower, even lower in normal tension glaucomas. So, so a POAG, we have to establish the target IOP. If still there is a progression, change the treatment, readjust the target IOP, set a new baseline, and follow up for less than six months. Now, to start a glaucoma therapy, monotherapy is preferred unless the pressures are too high. Prostaglandin analogs and beta blockers are usually the first line of drugs, uh, depending on the patient's, a, uh, the patient's pocket also and the side effects if, the committant, if there is any um, systemic illness also. Alpha agonists and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are second line of drugs, and row kinase inhibitors are showing a much uh, a good promise. So if we start with this therapy, they are well tolerated. And uh, uh, if uh, well tolerated and a target IOP is reached, then we do a periodic uh, uh, endpoints are verified. While if the target IOP is not reached, we add a second drug. And still, if it is not reached, then we substitute the drug or verify the efficacy. Other therapeutic options are surgery and laser. And if it is not tolerated and not effective IOP control, then we switch the monotherapy or consider laser till the target IOP is reached. So the general principles would be set a target pressure, consider the systemic health of the patient. Always consider whether the patient is suffering from any other systemic illness, consider the cost of the patient, uh, cost of the drug to the patient, consider the lifestyle, and consider compliance. So be very realistic, because if a patient with advanced glaucoma has an IOP of 30 millimeters of mercury on three agents, adding a fourth agent is not likely to bring the IOP further. You can go for an early surgery. So very important to be realistic in your uh, approach. The drugs, as we all know, uh, they either decrease the secretion or increase the outflow. And beta blockers, alpha-2 agonists, and CAIs are uh, the ones who decrease secretion. Uh, which secre and the trabecular and uv uh, increased outflow is by trabecular and uv uh, pathway. And uh, we all know, the, I'll go, just skip these because these are we all know, beta blockers, prostaglandin analogs, alpha-2 agonists, they should be uh, avoided in young because they can cross, cross the CNS barrier. So we, we have to avoid them. Dozolamide, benzolamide shows very good results. Osmotic agents only for acute uh, purposes, meiotics, uh, thankfully we are getting pilocarpine now uh, from today onwards and uh, maybe because we were also using the, the, uh, I, uh, the carpinol injections for our patients for PI and uh, rho kinase inhibitors are very good drugs now are, uh, available to us and these are uh, basically the effectors of rho pathways. Rho pathways are responsible for uh, uh, for the cell motility, differentiation, and apoptosis. So to prevent this apoptosis, these rose kinase inhibitors are there, and they have shown very good results in corneal wound healing also. In glaucoma, they improve the direct action on the trabecular meshwork and Schlem's canal. So, so can you sum it up? Yeah, I'm, I'm, summarizing, I'm summarizing. So combination therapies uh, need to be looked into because combination will reduce the cost and the side effects. So if a, it is the patient who needs to be treated, so be certain that the patient has an active disease and needs treatment because anyone, no, no one will have the courage to stop the treatment that you have started. And overall, there is a modest penalty for delaying the treatment in OHT subjects. This penalty is minimum for low-risk patients, but saves a lot of eyes from being unnecessarily treated. And thank you, the, mm, thank, thank you so you, much for this. Thank you, Sumit. So uh, till Devin is setting up his laptop, yeah. take a quick comment on this uh, from Dr. Manisha, sir. So he has covered the topic very well about the medical management and the basic principles that uh, we have been put. And I would like to stress the fact that uh, he's outlined how to calculate target pressure. Your method to calculate target pressure has to be simple and straightforward because you have to do it day in and day yes. out. Only point is that certain risk factors are to be given additional importance when you calculate uh, the target pressure. So over and above what he said, we can con give more importance to patients who have got pseudo-exfoliation, thin corneas, who are showing recurrent 
uh, disc hemorrhages and, uh, we, and also people who have got a fa family history of vision loss. Family history of glaucoma is there, but vision loss is a separate history which at least I ask because people who have become blind, parents who have become blind, their si uh, kids would carry a much higher risk of progressive glaucoma and so that should be kept in mind. I think uh, just one quick, uh, you know, emphasis basically, he mentioned the slide in the chart uh, which was shown. I think that don't miss the angle closure disease because most of the time, if, unless we look for angle closure disease, I think we often miss that. So we have to be mindful of the certain phenotypes which are more likely to be misdiagnosed or underrated and angle closure is one of them and pseudo-expression as uh, uh, he's already mentioned. So Devin, over to you. Can we have the slides, please? So, good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to thank a scientific committee and Dr. Amit sir for giving this opportunity. So, today I'm going to talk about glaucoma damage devices, basic steps, and some variation. So, in the present scenario, GDD has become the essential in glaucoma management with the development of the availability, availability of the indigenous low-cost implant, RD. These procedures have become a choice of surgery in the management of refractory glaucoma. So, what we are planning for GDD surgery, surgery should be the well prepared and we have to think about what kind of surgery we are going, going to do and uh, a long term IP control depend upon not only on the meticulous surgery, it also depend upon the surface area of the implant that determines the blab size and tissue response to implant and the thickness of the fibrous capsule controlling percolation of aqueous humor into the wall. So plan your surgery at the ahead and the technique also, what technique you are going to use and the, apart from the what size of the implant and what will be the location of your implant and what the position of implant into the anterior chamber or vitreous cavity or in sulcus, everything we have to plan ahead only. These are the various uh, damage devices are available. So most commonly used non-wall devices are bar belt and nadi, while the valve is a Ahmed glaucoma valve. So basically how to difference between the valve and non-wall, the valve devices provide the more immediate IP control and there's a low chance of the hypertony because the mechanism is working and the non blood devices are usually, usually often occluded with either the suture or with the stent but immediate IP control will not be there. It needs the anti medication till the suture has been lysed or you remove the stent. And the oral lab has developed it uh, uh, RD valve, this is a prototype of bar belt having three surface area of 350 millimeter and the Ahmed glaucoma most commonly used in adult is FP7 and FP84 pediatric. Now the new valve have the silicon tube and silicon plate so it has a good uh, outcomes. And these are the indications where the tubectomy is likely to fail, like Sturge Weber syndrome, Eisenfeld syndrome, Neradia, and these are some secondary glaucomas and some pediatric glaucoma are the common indication for glaucoma drainage devices. So these are the basic steps of surgery. So basic steps between valve and non-valve is in valve surgery, we have to isolate the muscle and tie the ligature of the tube. And so coming to the surgery, so this is the case of the pseudophagic glaucoma. The case of the pseudophagic glaucoma, so the phonics based conjunctival flap has been made. Do the nice blunt dissection, isolate the superior rectus and the lateral rectal muscle and muscle will be used to create the space underneath this muscle. So here we are creating a space under the muscle and the potency of the wall has been uh, tube has been checked, RD tube has been checked and this plate has been pushed under the belly of the superior rectus and the lateral rectus muscle, similar showing here. And at least this plate has to fix 8 to 9 millimeter away from the limbus and the plate has to be secured by using the 9 nylon suture, 2 9 nylon suture. Take the first skull bite first, when we are taking the skull bite first, and come into the uh, hole into the RD plate, and the knot automatically goes into the inside. So no need to struggle for the burying the knot because sometimes we have to bury difficult in burying knot and we can cut the knot. And this plate, tube has been fixed with nino nylon box suture. It should not be compressible suture. This suture has been applied. 
and after applying suture in the uh, this uh, tube has been occluded by using a 60 or vicryl vicryl 60 or 70 vicryl suture usually initially we started with the two vicryl sutures right now i'm using only single vicryl suture and the tube has been checked either is properly blocked or not and the covid era we really we struggle for the graft we not having so we can make this tunnel skull tunnel and a appropriate length of the tube has been cut around 2 to 2.5 mm and 23 gauze needle has been used to create the track and has to be really little careful because this is a partial thickness so needle going on the same base same moment you have to come back and push the tube into the anterior chamber and this flap has been closed by using the two vicryl suture and then again if we have to keep in mind it should not be too much tight closure so the tube should not be pressed and like any other surgery tube surgery also need the meticulous conjunctival closure so tube has to be nice so conjunctiva has to be nicely covered and it need water tight closure so coming to the in case we having the patch graft is available so similar way we mark the tube and its bevel should be up cut the tube at the 45 degree angle so you can get the nice bevel up and tube has been inserted into the anterior chamber after inserting take the partial thickness conical patch graft and the case patch graft is anchored by help of the nano nylon suture and the conjunctival closure has been done in a similar fashion so nowadays we started the new technique is patchless long tunnel graft so now no more we are using this any kind of graft mark the tunnel and mark the sclera by 4 to 4.5 mm away from the limbus it take the 23 gauze needle we have to involve the half thickness of the sclera and when we going and reaching into the limbus literally we have to dip down the needle and take it out it is little bit learning curve but after this having this uh, using this technique the surface is very smooth and there is a we not don't did we don't find of the any kind of exposure tube exposure is very good and conjunctival closure done after this procedure similar way so this uh, this technique is avoid the micro movement and late tube straightening and the study done by the george et al so is the good outcome in periodic and the adult glaucomas so this is again the ab internal technique in this technique uh, we published in igo recently this 21 gauge needle has been used taken from the opposite side of the limbus coming from the limbus and under the cap it is come out and like the trail trail take technique this tube has been fed into this needle and needle is been done into the anterior chamber so exactly the tube goes into the sulcus without having any difficulty similar way here also tube is feed into the needle and it has been taken out and conjunctival closure has been done in a similar way so that be published in igo and certain situation where a tube can't be placed into the anterior chamber we have to do parsimonial vitrectomy and tube has been placed into the vitreous cavity and the outcome are almost similar to the uh, anterior chamber so coming to the agb agb almost similar technique apply the good traction suture good traction is always good it get the good exposure do the phonics based flap and the valve has been primed we have to take care we should not touch this part of this agb because we chances of the we lost the valve mechanism again this is the two suture has been used to fix the plate to the sclera after fixing it after fixing it this had this case had been combined with phaco emulsification so after doing the phaco emulsification the tube had been fixed with box suture the similar similar fashion 23 gauze needle has been used and the tube has been placed into the and partial thickness conical patch graft used and conjunctival closure has been 
Then in a similar way, now AGV also you can do with the long tunnel track, the no need of the patch, gra patch graft. We have to aware of the certain complication, tubulated complication, and consider the patient risk factor, implant the uh, superiorly, uh, prioritize the placement of the material, recognize the cause of the tube exposure, and surgery should be well prepared, and follow period is equally important to achieve the good outcome. Thank you for kind attention. Uh, Bajuriya ma'am will take a comment from your side uh, and Dr. Satyan's side for his talk. Uh, thank you for your excellent talk because the audit tube has been modified by several people by several methods now and I think without the patch crafting I think Ganesh is doing something different, you are doing something different, George is doing something different. I hope uh, no, we, we are in same page, same page, sir. <laughs> I know all of you are in a different places, though in the same institution. Uh, but then uh, we, we are eager to see that outcomes at the end of five years or six years later, whether the tube exposure is going to be there or not. That is the one thing which we are all concerned. Those which I did in 1996-97, some of them definitely got extruded in spite of the patch grafts. But of course, the the micro. Uh, movements are one of the reasons for the exposure and the issues, but we hope that it doesn't have that in this because it's quite tight, though we are also doing that. Uh, so I hopefully, have yeah, please. I have a question. As you're saying that, you know, exposure is less. So apart from uh, uh, the, you know, there should be, it prevents micro motion, but then there are other risk factors uh, for the uh, extrusion of the tube and 2% is the incidence of you know, any uh, surgery, if you have done 100, then 2% can expose. And there are other risk factors if the patient has got multiple surgeries, if the conjunctiva is not in good health. So did you analyze that, like uh, uh, the uh, micro motion is just one factor, and you can prevent that by not inserting the needle uh, straight, but at an angle. So you just need it, you know, the tube just uh, should take uh, two mm angle should be there. So that is again, and then it should lie flat and you can cover it with a graft. So do you, did you actually analyze the factors which are responsible for? Yeah, so this, uh, the two study, but uh, this is a sort of time, I didn't mention it, but the study done by the Mexico, they include the 300, 316 patients over the period of the five years. Really, the incidence is very less. And the retrospective, Dr. George, I published in AOA, that a study has included that a no exposure in compared to the patch graft versus the long tunnel track. And basically, why we don't get the exposure? Because the four to five millimeter, the covering of the conjunctiva is very smooth. Most of the time, we get the exposure at the initial part, and near the limbus only we get the exposure, because the curvature, the eye curvature, we push, putting the patch graft, and patch graft is rubbing to the eyelid. So that's the main reason we get that exposure. Here, what we are doing, we are taking that long tunnel, at least four to five millimeter away. When you cover the conjunctiva, it's a smooth covering. There will be no elevation. I think that is the reason why we are not having such kind of exposure in long tunnel track in compared to the patch graft. Apart from that, certain patient to do Exposed. We, I can't. Nobody can give you a guarantee. This is a part and parcel of G glaucoma drainage device surgery. We completely accept that. Yeah. But only thing is, it should not be too high. That's the only. But yeah. you know yeah. what? I'm doing from 2005, when I was doing the tunnel only, like the tunnel only person types, and uh, in after 10 years, the exposure is very high. Very high uh -huh. means very high. That is why I said those which I did in Truly 96, 97. Used. Those are the <laughs> patients who had uh, exposure after. Uh, 10 years time. After so, 10 years, believe me, you should be prepared that somebody will or the other will walk into your So opinion. hopefully, we are hoping that it should not, but yeah. we'll have to wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I comment? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I have just modified my technique, like I do a tunnel, but I stop 2 mm before the limbus. Take a flap and insert the tube through the flap. 2 mm, 2 mm. Just 2 mm. Um, I'm, I'm talking about 4 mm. If you take no, the 4 mm. No, no, but <laughs> there is a flap through which the tube is gone inside. Yeah, same way I told you, that I yeah. make the big flap. Yeah, the first this, now this so called that. So for that last, so many years I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ma'am, it's called the double double tunnel track RD actually. You make the two, two tunnels. Right now, we have the one more modified way. If you ask, I'm telling you. See an exposure of my own patient. Maybe, even I can't, maybe expose. What, what next time, you can, next thing we can do, we make the tunnel to track the tube itself. No need for suture. First track, then second track, and directly put it in the anterior chamber. So the direction of the tube changes. 
Director chamber changes and that avoid the exposure. Ex actually, if you make a curved direction into the anterior chamber, really your exposure will be very, very less. But Madhu Madam, but it's going to happen, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I agree with you. So it, it is I not agree. that any, every patient is going to have an exposure. Yeah, yeah. We yes. Really, yeah. It is some patients we have an exposure. But so don't say every patient. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. But can I just you. add a point? I, I'm I sorry. <laughs> point is well taken. I, I used to do <laughs> corneal patch grafts. Uh, now, mostly I'm doing scleral patch grafts. And between corneal and sclera, actually sclera exposure is much more. This is what I've seen. I'm, uh, you know, I'm planning to publish this. Yeah. Right. So Thank now you. is Dr. Amit Porwal, and he'll be talking about tips and tricks of bleep, uh, bleb needling. Amit, you this thing. And time also, you got to mind because this time is lost. Yeah, I, I understand. So uh, tips and tricks of bleb needling. So when to do bleb needling, that is the most important decision one has to take. So the indications are failing bleb when you have a encapsulated high dome appearance bleb or you when have a flat and localized blebs. So the goal is to re-establish the fistula from the anterior chamber to the subconjunctal space where acute tumor may be reabsorbed. It was first described by Ferrer et al. in 1941. A lot of modifications have been there. So the re needling revision with MMC was first, first described by Mardelli in 1996. So what is this procedure? I'm just going to uh, describe the procedure first and show you some videos. It can be performed in the OPD or OT, which is a debatable issue. You have to use preoperative topical anesthesia, which are in drops and antibiotic drops, a wire speculum, a 26 to 30 gauge needle on a tuberculous syringe. Uh, I'll tell you which needle has to be taken later on. So this is a small video. I'm demonstrating this uh, procedure into the OPD on the slit lamp. So you have to in insert the needle about 5 millimeters away from the lateral edge of the uh, bleb as much posteriorly as possible. Then enter its subcontinental space into the bleb with the to and fro motion. As you go with the to and fro motion, you divide all the fibrous septates which are there and then you can enter into the subscleral space, dissect those septates by the to and fro motion and then you can enter into the internal ostium. You have to be very careful, the patient has to be very cooperative, your sister has to be very uh, attentive when you are performing this procedure, you don't want any head movements, you don't want to damage any vessels. But there are chances the vessels might be damaged, there might be a hematoma, but you must be able to avoid them as much as possible. So this was a pr procedure done pre-needling and post-needling the photographs, you can get a diffuse blep. So this is a needling being performed into the uh, OR, wherein a block is given, this patient was highly uncooperative, so I'm doing it in the OT, a stay suture is taken, uh, corneal stay suture. Now we have an adequate exposure when you take this stay suture. Subcontinental injection of mitomycin is injected as much away from the bleb posteriorly as possible. 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.1 ml of mitomycin of 0 0.02 strength. And then once you injected the mitomycin after uh, two to three minutes, you start brushing it uh, out posteriorly as much as possible. You don't want the mitomycin to uh, be anteriorly. Once you ironed out or brushed out the mitomycin and waiting period of five minutes, then with the help of a 27 gauge needle or a 26 gauge needle, you bend it in the form of a hydrocannula. Again, from the lateral edge, five millimeter away from the lateral edge of the posterior side of the bleb, you invade the subcontinental space with a to and fro motion, try to avoid the bleeders. And you can see, you can feel the resistance. Some patients, you'll be able to die the septates very easily. In some patients, you can have the grating sensation feeling when you're doing the, uh, when you're cutting the fibrous septas. So once it is done, subcutal space, you saw the needle going into the anterior chamber and there will be sudden aqueous uh, gush and the blood will be formed. And again, when you withdraw the needle, you apply the uh, uh, cotton bud, cotton tip uh, at the puncture side so that it gets adhered. And this is how you're going to manage it. So bleb needling is a very, very important procedure, but only thing is you have to explain the patient properly that this is not that this one procedure will give you a good result. You, you might have to tell that this might fail, you might repeat the needling or you have to go for a resurgery. So once the bleb is formed, if the AC is shallow, you reform it with the side put and this is how you are going to do a bleb needling. Uh, this is advantage when you are doing it in the OR because you can reform the side put, but in the OPD it is very difficult. So this is the picture showing uh, pre bleb needling post bleb needling multiple blebs you can see diffuse multiple blebs and it's a nice diffuse bleb so post needling change in the appearance of the bleb is very important you start with antibody steroid drop start with digital massage as i showed you we can use subcontinental mmc or 5 few you can give it superior temporarily before needling and then massage for 2 to 5 minutes so what are the results bleb with thick scar and quick failure i recommend to use mmc what does that's what the literature says and while those that succeeded longer and failed slowly they may respond adequately to 5 few Complications, the most important complication, what we see is intra uh, bleeding. There can be buttonhole, bleb leaks, hyphema, hypotony, endothelial toxicity if the mitomycin if, uh, goes inside, choroidal effusion, supracoidal hemorrhage. These are the layer complications, but the most important complication, what we see is intra bleeding. 
So how effective? It is more effective if it is performed within four months from the time of trabeculectomy. And it is less effective if the pre-needling IOP is more than 30, immediate post-needling IOP is less, uh, more than 10, or a trab is performed without an MMC. So the key points for needling is factors such as the time period after the initial trap and the degree of scarring will greatly affect the outcome. There are varying success rates ranging from 30 to 94 percent with a good long-term control. So looking at this success rate, we should always give a try of a blab needling before you subject the patient for a repeat trap or for a tube. It is a reputable procedure with minimal risk in the management of glaucoma patients, avoids the risk of invasive surgery as well as the need for daily medications. So needling a previously viable bleb conserves the conjunctiva and allows faster recovery and fewer complications than a repeat trap often with similar results. So always try to revive the old trabeculotomy site with needling and then go ahead. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you, Amit. I'll ask Shanta for a comment, please. No, I agree that you use uh, all the measures possible in the first three to four months after trabeculectomy before you start medications for a patient. Uh, you admit that uh, your surgery hasn't worked and you, if you restart medications, then you have not done your job. So try everything, removing releasables, laser sutilizers, subconjunctive fibrillation, and then needling after two to three weeks if the bed appears to be failing. But long-term results, I'm not so sure because if you want to really discuss success, you should have complete success. You should be able to control the uh, IOP without any med medications. So there are uh, meta-analysis, there is a Cochrane database which shows that uh, if you, you compare needling, uh, if you look at complete success rates, then you don't really achieve it. But with one or two medications, with needling, if you're able to prolong the life of the bag, that would be a very good thing. Yes. Thank you, Shanta. So our next, next speaker will be Dr. Alokesh. And he'll be performing the surgery of whose complication uh, Amit has managed. <laughs> so please come and create the situation yeah, that you don't have complications. Just, uh, before he starts, same uh, like what Dr. Shanta was mentioning. I've never been successful in my blood uh, needling. And one is when you're doing the blood needling, many times we kind of happen to have an autologous blood injection. So autologous serum injection, like so, we cause uh, more scar tissue formation than going in for a true blood needling. I, I think uh, Alakesh is ready, yeah. Uh, I think just a quick question, for the needling to work, actually needling is not for all patients, all failed blebs. So needling only works if your ostium is patent and there's some fluid trickling around the flap into the subtendons or subconjunctal space. So if the space is totally closed, then needling is not going to work. So I think preoperatively we have to have that assessment. Uh, good, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramit and AIOC for giving me this opportunity. I'll be speaking on trabeculectomy, the pre- and post-operative considerations also. So the first and the foremost pre-surgery uh, consideration for trabeculectomy would be that we have to ensure that the patient really needs trabeculectomy. We should be explaining in details the unpredictable nature of the post-op course in spite of the best surgeries done. And we should inform the patient that he or she may need to have a daily post-operative follow-up and secondary surgeries may be required. And we should explain to the patient about the long-term chances of failure of trabeculectomy and involve the patient in the de decision-making process and also take a informed consent for the patient. We should be prepared to stop all anticoagulants like aspirin, copidogrel, and even warfarin with a prior written permission from the patient's treating physician who may try to shift him even to low molecular weight heparin. And uh, stopping pilocarpine um, in a combined surgery or prostaglandin analog is individual choice. And topical antibiotic therapy, uh, preferably four generations uh, fluoroquinolones uh, to maintain a sepsis. So another uh, aspect is that we have to take a prior physician opinion for injection mannitol use and it is also very important to rule out uh, GFR compromise and exclude benign prostatic hypertrophy beforehand so that you don't land up with a acute urinary retention after injection mannitol and for combined surgery in patients taking drugs like tamsulosin you can use dispersive viscoelastics. In advanced glaucoma, we should always do a macular program with size 5 stimulus and note if there are any points of zero dollar B value along the horizontal meridian and thoroughly explain to the patient about the chances of macular ripet phenomena. Do not use retrobulbar block or adrenaline in the block and uh, be prepared to do a vitreous strap on table if there is a persistent high IOP on table. Always use a freshly prepared mitomycin C and do not use more than four days old preparation. 
we normally use 0.04% uh, for three uh, minutes, uh, sponges of about five millimeter to two millimeter dimensions. And also nowadays subconjunctival injection we are using. So this is a small video of uh, 0.2 milligram per milliliter mitomycin C injection about 12 to 14 millimeters away from the limbus in the superior bulbar conjunctiva and the applicator is used to spread the subconjunctival mitomycin C in a diffuse manner in the bulbar conjunctiva. So coming to the trabeculectory surgery itself, this is one of the variants. Many variants are possible. Uh, first we start with a superior rectus bridal suture, a corneal traction suture works equally well and then with a standardization effort to measure the limbal conjunctival area. We start the dissection at the conjunctival flap and uh, blunt dissection is carried backwards by the side of the suprarectus muscle as far posteriorly possible to create a posteriorly diffuse bleb. Gently at adequate quartary is performed. We usually measure a five by five or six by four base wire height triangular flap, partial thickness scleral incision is given and subconjunctival mitomycin C sponge and count and remove all of them with copious irrigation with balanced salt solution. Carry out the dissection with the 15 blade, maintain a single plane, prevent deepening or thinning of the plane as far as possible into the clear cornea and then a crescent blade is used to create the corneal lip. This is followed by a small paracentesis, which helps in forming or pressurizing the anterior chamber as per your requirement. And then the corneal entry, maybe with a side port, even with the keratome, and then the caddy sponge is used to create the stoma, stop before the white zone, and also move laterally to create a boot shaped punched area, a redectomy is done with a slight right and the left stretching of the iris to prevent the margins into the stoma. A partial thickness corneal bite is taken for the releasable suture. Be careful at this area not to have a full thickness through and through. And then the apex is taken and then partial thickness again to the scara Ensure at least four throws to prevent accidental release of the releasable suture and form the anterior chamber. Ensure that the tightness is optimum. And then we come to the conjunctival closer with 80 vicryl. First bite should include a part of the episclera and ensure a watertight closure. If one wishes to prevent an anterior leakage from the edge of the conjunctiva, we can take another anchoring suture to enable a proper watertight, watertight closure. So coming to the post-operative considerations, we do not usually take the tension application on the first day or early post-op uh, period unless not strongly indicated. And in that case, with proper acceptance of the bribrism, remember that an intraocular pressure of 24 millimeters of mercury can also be observed with good bleb morphology and proper lens size diaphragm position. In poor bleb appearance, it's important to do gonioscopy sometimes to find out whether there is a blockage of the stoma and sometimes lasers can be used to open them. A topical uh, two hourly prednisolone acetate is regimen is usually started in the first five to seven days with gradual taper depending upon the bleb appearance and vascularity. And uh, in some cases, studies have shown that uh, long-term benefits of uh, low dose like two times to one time per day graphical steroids up to three or more months have shown better bleb morphology and survival. We should be prepared to uh, have a shallow anterior chamber, specifically in chronic angle closure diseases. Do not panic as a knee-jerk reaction. Even very shallow anterior chambers with peripheral idocorneal touch can be observed when there is no lens cornea touch. However, beware of malignant glaucoma. Suture removal has to be a planned procedure in cases of two or more sutures, maybe one or more can be released by seven to 10 days, but usually we wait for a single releasable suture released by 14 days post-stop, but in rare cases it can be done earlier. This is a small video showing the suture release of the releasable suture on the slit lamp. 
After release of the suture, a mild pressure is given, calibrated on the cornea and ensure that there is aqueous flow in the subconjunctival space which can be observed in the state lamp like this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can also go for a laser suturalysis with a Hoskins lens, as we can see here. Thank you for your kind listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Alokesh. I'll request Dr. Bandav to give uh, a candid... A very nice uh, illustration of a, a trivialectomy. I think about, uh, I noticed uh, that you use only one suture at the apex, right? That yes, too is one of the variations sometimes we use more than <coughs> one. Yeah, I think most of us would feel comfortable with three yes. sutures or if the quadrangular flap, flap at least two sutures. Okay, but uh, I think it works. Again, the trivialectomy is something, you know, as many surgeons, as many techniques. So what works best in your hand, that is the best for you. So I think you have to basically, you know, do a number of surgeries and then decide what works, work, uh, works best for you. But essentially, I think he has demonstrated very well the fundamentals of surgery and what we need to take care and uh, what are the, uh, in the post-operatively as well as in the operative period. So I think that's very important. Yeah, thank you. So now Ganesh, please manage the complication. <laughs> Thank you, Madam. <laughs> uh, thanks to AIOC and uh, Dr. Amit Pura for putting this program together and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, this is a big talk, I mean, uh, and covering all the complications uh, within the eight minutes or seven minutes after the cut down is not going to really do justice. Uh, so I'll start off by showing this slide. This is uh, from the Shankar Nitrale group. And uh, one of the best articles to uh, read about complications of glaucoma surgery, published uh, almost 11 years back and uh, still holds water. So uh, in case you s I'm, able, I'm not able to complete my slide, please go back and read this articles. Uh, long article, so, uh, uh, so complications if you see it's uh, peroperative, uh, anesthesia related, congenital button holes, scleral flap complications, intraoperative bleeding and postoperative early post-operative, late post-operative. Of course, we won't be covering late post-operative, I'll just touch upon the early post-operative. Anesthesia related is, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Allocation mentioned, stop anticoagulants, but uh, coming to the block per se, we prefer the subtenance anesthesia nowadays. In, uh, in our institution, we have changed to subtenance. It's really very comfortable and uh, the incidence of uh, perforation has really reduced significantly. Congenital buttonholes can occur and they occur mainly because of poor visualization or poor exposure to the visual, uh, to the surgical field and poor quality of instrumentation, poor quality in handling the tissue, that is surgeon error or poor quality of the instruments. So management is that you have to immediately identify and apply sutures to address that immediately, that's direct repair. <coughs> Scleral flap complications can occur uh, mainly uh, because the depth of the flap is inadequate. So I would just highlight here that uh, the 15 number barter and pocket knife or even the crescent blade has a one millimeter bevel. So if you want to achieve 50% of the depth, you can see that it's a one millimeter bevel. If you want to achieve 50% depth of the scleral flap, you just uh, 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 make a groove and just you can measure approximately when you tilt the blade, you find that it is 50% into the groove. It is stained by blood. So that give you, gives you a good idea that you are in the correct depth. So you're not very deep, neither are you very superficial. If you have a deep flap, it's very likely to uh, scar very fast and uh, under filter. If you have a very thin flap, you are likely to get a over filtration. And congenital button holes, intraoperative bleeding uh, can cause uh, congenital bleedings, uh, scleral bleeding, intraocular uh, bleeding can also occur. And you must always be wary of operating hypertensive patients. So they have a tendency to ooze, even if you control the blood pressure very well, the time they spend in the OR and the uh, air conditioning and they are, you know, they have had their meal quite some time before the BP really rises and you must anticipate that, you know, they'll bleed a little bit more in spite of you are taking a lot of other precautions. So supracural hemorrhage is one thing which you have to be very, very risk factors are AFAK, Victor Thomas dies, congenital glaucoma, pathological myopia, anticoagulant use, significant hypotony during the procedure, higher IOP and all longer exhale length. So be very careful, try pre-place sutures, use mannitol. I also have a tendency to do a preventive sclerotomies about eight millimeters in the infrotemporal quadrant to prevent such a complication during surgery. And uh, management is that scleral flap should be closed immediately and you can always do, if you have confirmed, you can do an intraoperative sclerotomy once the situation has arisen. Uh, 
for per operator was uh, considered topical perivalvular or subtendinous anesthesia, never use tooth for forceps to handle the conjunctiva, aim for watertight conjunctival closure, lower high intraocular uh, pressure before surgery, and never leave the operating room with the unclosed leak. So coming to the post-operative complication, they can be classified in four ways, high IOP with deep AC, high IOP with shallow AC, low IOP, shallow AC and low bleb, low IOP, shallow AC and diffuse bleb. Coming to the first one, which is high IOP with deep chamber, so it's tight closure of the wound, mainly because you may have a thick skull flap. You can give digital massage, you can release the suture, as Dr. Madhu, Madhuriya Madam has mentioned, you can do a lot of things to make sure that the bleb uh, functions very well. And uh, the window period for <coughs> all these interventions is about two to four weeks, like Dr. Shanta has mentioned, don't think that the bleb is not functioning. You could try all these things till about four months. Uh, tenensis is actually the exteriorization of the anterior chamber. So it is because of bleb encapsulation, second to fourth week uh, post-operative period. You have a tight, uh, tense appearing bleb and the bleb is formed with no microcyst. Incisus is about nine to 15 percent. But nowadays we don't see that very much because the instrumentation and visualization exposure has much uh, improved. And bleb needling is the uh, measure to manage this. You may have to even sometimes excise the cyst uh, and do a bleb revision. Shallow chamber and high IOP. So you have three entities, mainly pupillary block, malignant glaucoma, and supracranial hemorrhage. Pupillary block this is the first differential diagnosis where you find the central AC is deeper. And that's mainly because you, when you did the aratectomy, you left the posterior pigment layer intact. So that could be one of the possibility. Uh, easy way to overcome that is do a PI, laser PI over that pigmented uh, tissue and it responds well to aridotomy, aridectomy. And sometimes you had given the instruction but the patient has not used the steroids properly or psychoplegics properly. Malignant glaucoma is uh, very difficult to treat. Uh, it's mainly because the antechamber has been entered without an existing PI in an angle closure disease or sudden lowering of the chamber in a, causing uh, shallowing of the chamber suddenly. So patient is usually asymptomatic, sometimes they may have severe pain, but usually they have mild discomfort. You can have a flat or shallow in ch uh, chamber uh, with corneal edema, IOP may be normal or elevated, and fundus exam uh, may be normal, but USGB scan can get a aqueous pockets and high gain setting. So you should also confirm that with a patent aridotomy, which should be patent. So how do you confirm? Uh, so you confirm the aridotomy, and then you try maximum medical therapy. And the, use atropine, that's very important. So you get a response to treatment. You don't reverse the condition, but you get a response to treatment. And that is indicated by deepening of the chamber and the reduction of the intraocular pressure. So once you get a response to treatment, the definitive treatment is to make the eye a unicameral eye. So you have to make a communication between the vitreous cavity and the antechamber. Pseudophagic eyes, it's very easy. Uh, you can do a hydrotomy. We prefer to do a vitrotomy usually. And the fellow eye may develop the same condition. Coming to supracordial hemorrhage, which can be late presentation. The incidence 2 to 7 percent given in the literature and risk factors I already mentioned. Pain and congested eye and reduced vision can be there with raised IOP, flat or uh, shallow chamber and large choroidal detachment. And you can have a blood in the suprachoroidal space. Uh, coming to uh, congenital buttonholes which can cause a low IOP and uh, shallowing of the chamber. So risk factors include uh, prior ocular surgery, ocular scarring, congenital scarring, poor tissue handling, thin conjunctiva. It's crucial to examine this. And these are the sites of buttonholes. You can have them anywhere in the conjunctiva. And the best way to suture them, use a figure of eight uh, suture or a mattress suture. If it's in the limbus area, you just use a, a buttress suture to suture the conjunctiva. So mitomycin C removal is also important. Uh, don't use uh, vexel sponges, use polyvinyl alcohol sponges so that you can remove the sponges in total. If you see here, the sponge is being removed and the mitomycin C sponges come out in pieces. And you can, sometimes if it's left, you can have a buttonhole like this. So to prevent that is to use a, a mitomycin C sponge tied with a vical suture, which you can remove in total. Scleral descents is again a complication of uh, low IOP and uh, shallow chamber. And so this is one of the situations where we published removing of the surreal suture has caused supracoral hemorrhage. And management of this is drainage of the clot after seven to 10 days. So indications are you have kissing uh, CDs, vitreous incarceration, we are additions. And coming to low intraocular pressure or flat bleb, you have congenital wound leaks, serous choroidal detachment, and cyclodialysis cleft. Uh, congenital wound leaks uh, can be tested using a CEDLS test, and it's important to address them immediately. Look for uh, any leaks immediately after the surgery. And pressure panded bandage was helpful in the immediate post-operative period. You can tampon it with devices. And always check the other eye to compare, especially when you're operating angle closure glaucomas, you find that the chamber also is uh, shallow. So you'll have, uh, if you have a wound leak, you'll have more uh, shallow than the comparative other eye. 
And suture line leak is something which if the canyon tab has not been closed properly, you will find that the leak is there. You have to address this immediately and you get a CDLS positive. You use a fluorescein uh, strip and see the flow from the aqueous. Serous coral detachment. Uh, hypotony is something which precipitates coral detachment post-operatively. And surgical drainage is very important, especially if you have complications related to vision, cornea, or compromising the blip. So I think I'm short of time. Cyclodialysis can happen if you are pulling that iris too much and you have a cyclodialysis cleft. And you have low IOP, shallow chamber, excessive filtration, not responding cases, which require surgical intervention. So early post-operative period, uh, last slide. So digital massage is very helpful. Suture lysis and releasable suture can be used. Early recognition of signs of scarring and appropriate treatment improves success rate of trap. And aqueous misdirection, difficult to treat unless recognized early. And choroidal detachment can be prevented if appropriate care at the time of surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ganesh. You really covered uh, really super fast. Uh, <laughs> and covered everything. Now I'll ask Dr. Sunita to comment on the thing. And uh, we'll request Nitin to come on the thing. I think uh, it was a very vast topic and covered really nicely. So I think you can prevent most of these complications by preparing the patient preoperatively and intraoperatively. So never operate an eye which has high pressure. You have to reduce the pressure preoperatively by mannitol or whatever measures. Nowadays, we use steroid also so that you can uh, you know, control the inflammation of the conjunctiva. Intraoperatively also try to ma maintain the anterior chamber all the time, prevent sudden hypotony, uh, uh, have uh, pre-placed sutures so that you can tie them immediately once you have done the sclerostomy and releasable sutures, I think, so that on the table you have normal pressure and then later on you have the option to re uh, lower down the pressure. And I per personally feel, uh, do the Moore Fields safe surgical technique where then, uh, wherein I don't cut uh, <coughs> one millimeter on the sides so as to facilitate the posterior flow. So I think you can prevent these complications to a large extent. But still, still, I think uh, you can have complications and how to manage, you have already covered. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk about mix and I've been given four procedures in seven minutes. So I'll try to run through them and I'll talk a little bit more about eye stent. Uh, so we have plethora of surgical options and today I'm going to talk about abdominal surgeries which are slim canal based. Uh, so, uh, currently we know there are limitations of using drops because of uh, compliance issues and ocular surface disorder issues. Uh, other option is laser trabeculoplasty, which can be a good adjuvant to the medical therapy, but we know that uh, the effect of laser trabeculoplasty wears off over time. And then we have conventional surgeries like trabeculectomy and tube shunts, which work great, but there I would reserve them more for more advanced glaucomas. So we need some effective procedures for mild to moderate stage of glaucoma. And uh, that's where mix co comes into the picture. Now, what we are treating is juxtacanalicular meshwork, which is the major site of uh, aqueous outflow resistance. And by doing mix, we try to remove uh, this juxtacanalicular meshwork along with the uh, inner wall of uh, Schlem's canal to, so that aqueous gets access to the collector channels. Now, we have different ab internal Schlem's canal procedures like ab internal trabeculectomy in the form of trabectome, micro bypass uh, micro stent in the form of eye stent. Then I have internal trabeculo, uh, trabeculotomy in the form of GAT that is using a proline uh, causing 360 degree fracture in the trabecular meshwork and then dilatation of the canal using internal approach that is ab internal canaloplasty. Now, uh, what are the indications for mix? I would reserve them primarily for mild to moderate glaucomas. Uh, uh, you can do, it, do them in phacic as well as pseudophacic patients, but in pseudophacic visualization of angle is easier. Uh, then uh, especially I would uh, use them for patients who are intolerant to medication or those having ocular surface disorders and we know when uh, uh, patients using more than one drop, uh, a large percentage of them have a uh, lot of blepharitis and ocular surface disorders and positive inflammatory tests. And, uh, and those patients who you know are poor, poorly compliant to the medications. One important thing is you have to do gonio, uh, good go gonio before you plan a mix and make sure that you're able to see angle structures very clearly so you know exactly where to insert your device. Now the first procedure is trabectone. It's a simple electrocautery device which has got a distant plate which is uh, uh, which insulates the ocular tissue from and it prevents damage to the tissue 
and once it it cuts through the trabeculum meshwork it also absorbs the material release so that inflammation is controlled uh, one of the limitations for the, this procedure is it is a quite expensive and disposable probe uh, this meta analysis showed that it caused a decent drop in the iop of almost 31% and uh, either you do trabectome alone or you combine it with the FACO and uh, both of them got, caused a decent reduction in IOP. Only surprising thing I found was the, in a combined there was a laser IOP drop than a, a trabectome alone. Generally you expect other way around because doing FACO itself will cause some drop in the IOP and success rate was pretty decent at 66%. The next procedure is uh, bent ab internal goniectomy. This is the most cost effective way to do it as you just need a 27 gauge needle which you bend 90 degrees at the end and just swipe few clock hours of trabe uh, trabecular meshwork exposing the Schlem's canal. Now this is a pretty simple and uh, cost effective procedure uh, uh, described by Shebian is uh, Dr. Shebiani. However, I did not find much of a scientific literature on this. This was some study presented in ARVO which showed that there was a 20% reduction in IOP over 3 months and uh, almost um, IOP reduction of 20% was found in almost more than 50% patients. Uh, so for the cost of the procedure and simplicity, I think it's a very uh, good procedure uh, uh, to do along with your cataract surgery. Uh, another interesting procedure is GAD, GAD Gonia assisted, uh, assisted Transluminal Trabeculotomy. So basically uh, you fracture 360 degree uh, trabecular meshwork by passing uh, either uh, yeah. uh, the, the most cost effective is just taking a 6-0 proline, making the end blunt with a cautery and just passing it around three, 360 degrees okay. and once you retrieve the other end just pull, the both head, pull both ends out so you get a 360 degree fracture and um, it worked in all types of glaucoma, pseudo exfoliation, POAG, pigmentary and a very decent drop in IOP of 58%. Uh, only problem was a post-operative hyphema which was found in large percentage of patients in first week. Almost 68% but in most of them it resolved over a week. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about eye stain because that is something I started doing two months back. Uh, and this is a micro device which is made up of titanium. It is MRI compatible and heparin coated so that it doesn't get clogged with the blood easily. And it is the smallest device to be implanted in the human body. Now there are multiple studies and one of them is uh, this study which uh, uh, studied outcome of uh, eye stent inject in open angle glaucoma is over 4 years. And you can see there was a 46% IOP reduction and 95% uh, of the patients were medication free. Uh, so that was an excellent result uh, of 46% uh, IOP drop and almost 95% had IOP of less than 18 millimeters of mercury and 4 years is a long period. Now this was another study, uh, we studied insertion of two eye stains in the same eye against that of Travoprost and you can see that the, the eye stain group has performed quite well. Um, and the treatment success rate was 77% in Einstein group uh, and 53% uh, uh, in Travoprost group. Then this was a meta-analysis for eye stent uh, surgeries and you can see there was a, and this was over 60 months, so that was a pretty long period and you can see consistent 30% reduction in the IOP and you can see there was a 7 uh, millimeters of mercury mean IOP drop uh, over uh, 60 months. Uh, and uh, there was a significant improvement in the ocular surface disorder. You can see that uh, the mean fluorosin, that is uh, TBUT, almost 49% uh, 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 longer time for a tear of tear breakup time. So good improvement in tear breakup time, significantly reduced staining, and there, uh, there was also reduced hyperemia. So uh, reducing ocular surface uh, disorder is a very uh, important thing because uh, that is one, one of the major reasons why patients compliance is affected and this is another long study and the interesting part of this study was it also studied severe open angle glaucomas and you can see that there, there was almost 6 millimeters of mercury drop over 6 years post operative. So we know that every millimeter of mercury counts and 6 millimeters in a advanced glaucoma shows that it is pretty effective. And then comparing eye stent with eye stent inject, eye stent inject of course was uh, better in reducing uh, intraocular pressure. There was more reduction of drops in a uh, eye stent inject group and both uh, groups became medication 
free. Almost 70% of the eyes in both uh, groups were medication free. So just to describe the technique, now I started practicing on my routine phaco cases almost a month before I planned a surgery and uh, you should know gonioscopy very well. You need to start practicing this direct gonio. So after end of your every cataract case, you can just learn to rotate patient's head and uh, learn to rotate your microscope. So your microscope should be tilted towards you and patient's head away from you. So you're seeing parallel to the iris directly into the angle. Uh, this glaucos provides this uh, eye prism, which is a good disposable prism along with the eye stain. And um, you have to use an excellent viscoelastic also. Uh, IOCare makes 1.8% helon, which works very well. Uh, magnification is the key. So before you actually start inserting the uh, device, you make sure that your position is perfect. You are focused on the trabecular meshwork and use maximum magnification so you know exactly where you are inserting your device. So see I'm putting some jelly over the cornea to have a good uh, coupling agent for my eye prism. You need a very good visco because you need a strong, I mean a very well formed anterior chamber. Uh, initially I tried using the basic one in my first case and uh, there was some problem. So this is the best. IOCare makes 1.8% and it's good. Now, you, now I've gone in. Now you see that there is a red reflux in the uh, trabecular meshwork. The, this at the end of FACO, you generally get this blood reflux in the uh, Schlem's canal, and that makes identifying Schlem canals much easier. Uh, so you go at an angle, and once you in, you become parallel, and just insert that device inside. Uh, trabecular, you can just see that uh, body of the device uh, uh, partially through the trabecular meshwork. And it is basically the feel, you know, after doing one or two cases, you know that you are exactly in the correct plane. So once you get that feel, your surgery becomes faster. And uh, that's it. It takes very short time to do it. Uh, another thing is you should see some blood reflux coming out after you insert the device. So you are sure that you are in the right uh, place. And when you do, you can see, I'm, I'm just showing it again. And you can see that snorkel is facing towards you and you can see some blood oozing out. The, so that says that you are in a perfect plane. For the constraint of time, I am not showing eye stent inject case, but both cases are, both the devices are pretty user friendly. And once you get a hang of it, you should not take more than five minutes to finish the case. And these are very quick results, but we have just done nine cases. Uh, I am presenting only eight because one person uh, was a ENT surgeon and I had explained her she might not be the great case for it but she still wanted to try it before we, we, I go for a trial and I'm done. So you can see I did uh, nine cases and uh, there was a decent almost 20% reduction in IOP and almost 16% drop in the uh, use medicines but th this is a very small number. Uh, these are very early results. So as we do more uh, we will know exactly how it's working. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin, for finishing in time. And I'll request now Medha, Sunita, and all those who are left uh, here now to <laughs> give a comment. <laughs> uh, what is the price of this? Uh, the eye state is around 60,000, and the eye state index is one and a half lakhs. But I think the company guys are here. So that is the MRP. You get it. You one lakh five thousand for the eye stand inject, and 45 or 50,000 for eye stand. Yeah. So uh, I think nice presentation. Now I stand like we all have been. A lot of surgeons have started doing, including me. So I have done three, uh, four uh, as of now. Two I stand inject and two plain I stand. So the tips which, which I would like to give is that I started doing goniotomies with trabectome three years back. So start with goniotomy and bank procedure as you mentioned. I think is very easy. And there you do not need that much of magnification, but when I switch to eye stand, then you need a lot of magnification because you have to insert the, the device into the trabecular meshwork. So you need to have a good microscope also because when you increase the magnification, the illumination goes down and the visibility goes down. So I think that is the major problem which I face, but now I've got used to it. So I, but I think I have also done it and next day the pressure was seven, eight. I have not followed up the patient for so long but I have long-term results of trabectome and bang, and now I've started doing GAT also. So I would just suggest that before starting, I think the intraoperative gonioscopy, after doing FACO, one should get used to doing gonioscopy. 
and just try to navigate some kind of uh, you know instrument like sinski or hook or something into the angle so that you get a hang of it and then start with the bang because you're not going to cause much harm even if, if you can identify the angle properly and uh, do a goniotomy with that bent needle, you are not going to cause much harm, even if you have not done it correctly. And over a period of time, when you get hang of it, then you can start with these procedures. And I think now we have a choice and myriad of choices and we can individualize uh, treatment for our patients, mild and moderate. Uh, when we are performing cataract surgery, we can do mix. So I think I can see the next team. Prashant, are you in the next team? Can so. I just make a few points, please? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Nitin, excellent presentation. Very, very good. I would just like to add a few points. One is um, with MIGS, I would stop medication post-operatively, day one. I wouldn't continue because you will then never know how much drop you are getting with the procedure per se. Um, Three weeks to four weeks is when all the drugs wash out, in case you're using a prostaglandin analog. Um, by that time, you will be sure how much of a pressure drop you have got. So maybe perhaps that's the reason why there is a difference between what you have got and what I have analyzed in my cases. Um, second thing is for all those people who are worried about cost. I don't think you're worried about costs of uh, multifocal IOLs, are you? So. Glaucoma is a serious disease. If you put it correctly to a patient who is undergoing cataract surgery, I'm sure they will understand. And moreover, it is at the moment fully reimbursable by insurance, fully. All the cases I have done so far have been reimbursed fully. So please consider it. I, I would definitely say, and of course, you have to start by practicing uh, intraoperative gonioscopy. There is no no way out from it. Thank, Thank you. I think we can discuss afterwards. Yeah. It's not fair to get on the time of other people. We are just in the tea time.